This is the story of how gay sex changed Britain from the nation of the missionary position into a place where almost anything goes. The most exciting, the most dangerous, the most thrilling thing you could do. Having anal sex, having threesomes, sperm was flying everywhere, they were sweaty, and it was fabulous. There once was a time when man on man action was actually illegal. No men kissing in public, no hard ons on the top shelf, no butt plugs on the high street, a place where anal sex would get you locked up. There was a certain amount of cruising on Clapham Common, which was an extraordinarily risky thing to do, and I, I got beaten up. Here, you quit. And immediately your gut reaction would, you'd go, no. Then the law changed, and gay men led the charge of a sexual revolution. One of the prime tenets of gay liberation was that gay liberation is everyone's liberation. The sex life of Britain has never looked back. By the mid-1960s, after years of post-war drudgery, Britain's libido was blooming. The boys had long hair, the girls were on the pill, and sex was suddenly fun. They called it the Summer of Love, but not everyone was invited to the party. All over the country, gay men were forced to live and love in the shadows. Prior to 1967, um, being gay was, uh, was something that was actually very difficult. You had to be very brave uh, to be openly gay. Whenever homosexuality was mentioned, it was always in a context of crime, of some sort. Crime and a terrible life. And, and a life of concealment, a life of shame, of potential disgrace. I remember my first boyfriend being quite conscious about being careful to make sure the doors were locked, to, to close the windows, close the curtains, because we didn't want to have that risk of a knock on the door in the middle of the night, or even worse, a sledgehammer bashing down the door. The vast majority uh, lived lives of great isolation and fear. It was quite a risky game of cat and mouse with the police meeting other gay people. Gay men met each other before the 67 Act, as, as they always had in secret places that were known to other gay men. It all happened in the open air. It happened at the bus stop. It happened in the underground. It happened in the v &A. You could go to the Victoria and Albert on a Sunday afternoon and gaze through a vitrine at Italian Renaissance bronzes. And on the other side, there would be somebody. The establishment's denial that gay men even existed only ended with the Sexual Offences Act of 1967. Gay sex was finally legal, but other than that, the act was a total fudge. Consenting sexual behaviour between adult men in private was legalised. Nothing else. Nothing in public. Nothing under 21. It was as though the powers that be had decided that they had, for political reasons, to make some kind of concession to the homosexual fraternity. Um, but they were buggered if they were going to do anything serious about it. Just in case anyone got carried away, Lord Arran spelt it out once and for all. I asked those homosexuals to show their thanks by comporting themselves quietly and with dignity. Any form of public flaunting would be utterly distasteful. Doing the exact opposite was to become Gay Liberation's manifesto. After centuries of silence, it was time to make a noise. I was one of the 30 or 40 people who helped organise and publicise Britain's first ever gay pride parade, which took place in July 1972. It was a bit scary. It was very scary. About 30 or 40 of us straggling down Oxford Street, chanting and, and, and waving our pink flags and triangles and so on, uh, with what looked like a rather severely hostile group of people lined up on a Sunday, you know, the Lord's Day. The reason why we needed gay pride was that we had a built-in shame that most gay people were conditioned to feel, and therefore gay pride was needed as an assertive uh, gesture. My first gay pride was the, I think it must have been the mid-70s, where I think we marched from somewhere like Marble Arch 
and we marched along and saying two, four, six, eight, is that copper really straight? It started as a protest march and grew into a corporate sponsored parade. Gay Pride has become the country's annual celebration of sexual freedom. When I used to go in the 80s, there was always that thing of people with placards saying, hello, mum, on them. Because there was this whole thing about, oh, but what if anyone sees you? You know, we'd, we don't want the world to know you're a homosexual. Well, actually, you do. Hello, mum. I know you don't know, but it's all all right. <laughs> the first gay pride I went to was the last pride that was held at Kennington Park. And uh, I think there was something like 60,000 people there. I remember on the march, looking down Whitehall and seeing what would have been a tiny march by today's standards and just being so excited that there was like so many gay people all in one place. I remember being on the tube and slowly the, the, the sort of the non-gay people filtering off the tube until you were in a carriage just full of people all going to the same destination and arriving at Marble Arch and just being completely overwhelmed by the number of people and obviously you notice the drag queens because they're so colourful and you know when you're, when you're a boy from Wales who hasn't really seen much of that you're a little bit sort of taken aback by that. Leading from the front, Britain's gays have turned politics into a party. By the mid-70s, while gay pride was bringing Oxford Street to a standstill, Planet Heterosexual was having a bit of a wobble. Women were on the march and men were on the dole queue. The optimism of the 60s had had its day, and free love was coming off the menu. Maybe it was just the haircuts, but straight sex was having serious problems. Amidst all the confusion, gay men broke from the pack and published the first edition of Gay News. Once I had a copy of Gay News, I suddenly was able to find out how big the gay scene was. I had a map of that world, and I knew phone numbers of what else was available, what other clubs existed. There were personal ads in the back. I remember stealing myself to be brave enough to buy a copy of Gay News and to take it with me on the top deck of the number 88 bus from Clapham into London and determinedly reading it and not wanting people to see that I was reading it but also thinking that I must not be ashamed to be reading it on a bus. I started buying my Gay News at the newsstand and reading it openly on the tube as a gesture of political defiance. To my surprise, the world didn't fall on my head, except that one day I was aware in a crowded carriage of a man of military bearing behind me with a moustache and a pinstriped suit, clearing his throat and kind of looming over my shoulder, going... <coughs> I could sense he was about to say something, and I was readying myself for the blow. It came out fortnightly, and I'd just bought the brand new edition, and it's finally said, the fortnights just seem to fly by, don't they? The time was ripe to address another pressing need, the total absence of gay porn. My first gay magazines was my mum's catalogue. You know, you leafed through it to get to the underwear page. The health and efficiency mags, um, those amazing uh, magazines that came from the States of guys sort of posing like that. Occasionally, from a barrow, somewhere behind where the British Library now stands, uh, one could pick up a copy of an American magazine called the Physique Pictorial. They weren't frightfully erotic, and nothing much was happening. Um, a little classical wrestling. Rude pictures, the straight man's dirty secret, were now the gay man's playground. The thing to be said about uh, gay pornography is that it's just got better and better. As far as one can make out, the, the boys all have a lovely time doing it. <laughs> it was shame-free porn, putting the penis back in the mainstream for the first time since ancient Rome, if only at half-mast. I've forgotten what the actual degree measurement, the protractor, you know, measurement was, but if you could see an erect penis, something that was more erect than the mole of Kintyre, then that was obscene and uh, it, it was criminal. When gay porn magazines arrived in the newsagent, it meant that I didn't have to shoplift Playgirl anymore. The revolution was on a roll. Gay men had taken to the streets, printed their own paper, 
made news agents blush and were now colonising the pubs. Earl's Court was Britain's first gay village. Out, proud and over the top. It was the coolest place in London. At that time, Earl's Court became the place to be. There were a number of pubs at Earl's Court which were openly gay. And I went there once. I was very brave and decided that I was actually going to go into one of these pubs. I've forgotten the name of it now, but I had a few drinks with some friends. And then I decided to walk home afterwards. And I was so excited and so tense and so elated by having actually gone into a gay pub with other gay people all around me that I walked straight into a lamppost and, and smacked myself straight, straight in the face. I think it was a kind of letting off of the tension. Earl's Court, in, in my head, was always much more hardcore. It was always um, the moustaches, the, the, the infamous Colhern that um, I think I only ventured into once. To see people um, gallivanting off to Earl's Court without a motorcycle, but with everything else, um, seemed to me more than faintly ridiculous. And then you've got people who wore long bare boots with spurs. I think the, the height of absurdity, clip-clopping down the Elscourt Road with spurs on your boots in order to go to the coal home. The coal home was famous for, uh, for leather guys and denim guys. And I remember standing there one night, and uh, Sunday evenings was always very good, because interestingly, even in the coal home, they'd have drag occasionally. So there was these guys all in leather, Look, looking like they'd just stepped out of this amazing film. Leather and chains. And we were all watching or listening to some music, and suddenly outside, there was this motorbike, and it went vroom, 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 vroom. And one of these guys went, oh, my God, was that a motorbike? And the other one went, no, don't worry, it's some old queen with whooping coughs. <laughs> In 1974, the BBC could resist no longer, and the first overtly gay character minced proudly into primetime. Mr Humphreys, do me a favour, take that man's inside leg. Don't ask me, I've given it up for Lent. <laughs> I didn't know it was camp. I didn't know it was gay. I didn't know it was innuendo. But I did know it was funny. And I think that did shape my sense of humour, because I ended up laughing at them more I would anybody. And I think I saw a lot of myself in them. I remember when I was teaching, uh, a little boy in one of my classes said to me, "Yes, yeah, sir, I saw a movie last night, one half like you. I said, oh, what was it called? He said, oh, it was called, oh, you are awful. Oh, thanks. I'm sure you'd enjoy life in my regiment, sir. What regiment, sir? The Queen's. The Queen's? <laughs> oh, I say. Camp has always been very uh, accessible for straight audiences. Larry Grayson was very accessible. Frankie Howard was very accessible. Kenneth Williams was very accessible. They were all... It's a very easy thing to latch on to. <laughs> oh, what a gay day. <laughs> it was mainstream. And yes, you know, looking back, I can say, well, it wasn't a stereotype that actually liberated me or liberated anyone. But, but laughter, as the drag queens knew, was the best way from stopping someone from attacking you. Over on ITV, gay men even had sex. John Hurt landed a BAFTA as Quentin Crisp, fleshing out the old cliches with gusto. The instant crude reaction to the idea of gays is that they're all effeminate, that they're all paedophiles, that they're all uh, longing to get into slap and drag and be fucked by ten sailors. And, and, uh, um, the, with the exception of the paedophile thing, but it, the Naked Civil Zone kind of reinforced that idea quite strongly. Can I walk you home? You think I'm a woman, don't you? <laughs> well, you sure wiggle your fanny like a woman. Frankly, I'm not a woman. Frankly, do I care? Hotting up the aisles of the Art House Brigade was John Schlesinger's Sunday Bloody Sunday. Here were manly men actually falling in love with each other, just like normal people. It was a portrayal of a recognisable kind of bisexual, stroke gay life and situation. It didn't have a happy ending, but, uh, you know, in those days, how could a gay film have a happy ending? It was a great breakthrough. It was a great stride forward. But it wasn't a, a destination of any kind.
In 1978, Gay's March into the Mainstream got its anthem. Sing if you're glad to be gay. Sing if you're happy that way. Hey, sing if you're glad to be gay. Sing if you're happy that way. Amazingly, the whole nation started singing along. No one was more surprised than Mr. Robinson himself. When we went out and toured during TRB's 15 Minutes of Fame, we played to packed houses where the whole audience of two or three thousand people would sing along with every word of the chorus. And I thought at one point, the world hasn't changed this much. What's going on here? And I stopped the song at a show at Hammersmith Odeon and went and kissed the keyboard player. And sure enough, a shockwave of revulsion passed through the audience like, this is a bit dodgy. Do you really want to hurt me? Whether or not the pop audience was ready for man-on-man -man action, more and more gay singers took up the anthem's call. Almost by stealth, Top of the Pops was transformed into a showcase for gay Britain. It did seem for a while as if there was room for almost every puff in the country. <laughs> on Top of the Pops. I can remember very well the first time that Culture Club were on Top of the Pops and I can remember at the end of it my stepdad saying, no, is that a boy or a girl? And me saying, of course it's a girl, they don't go that far. <laughs> I just thought I would um, be honest in interviews and things and not, if somebody asks you about your girlfriend, I'll say, well, I've got a boyfriend and just, you know, make it matter of fact. At that time, it was really kind of riding the crest of a wave. As a teenager, seeing people like Mark Harmon on top of the pops and, uh, and then Jimmy Somerville, who's, you know, was, just came out in a blazing trail. <laughs> If I'd known what the word homoerotic meant when I was about 16, I would have used that word, but I didn't have that word in my vocabulary, but being really stunned and excited. Gay had broken from the fringes and was setting the pace of pop culture. Its stars were smarter, its beats faster, and its dance clubs were out of this world. The most sexed up of them all was a place called heaven. Anyone who was anyone Gay or straight, queued up to get beyond the velvet rope. First time I went to heaven, I couldn't believe it. The fact that it was carpeted, it was bright, that people were nice to you when they served you drinks, that you could dance on the floor till two o'clock in the morning. When I first went to heaven, which I think was in the very early 80s, I was already a member of parliament by then, I was amazed that such a, an above ground apparently mainstream, large-scale club, that it could exist. I loved it, but uh, as a member of parliament, I needed to be reasonably discreet and careful. Probably not a place for a, an MP to be going to after voting in the House of Commons every evening. The music and the atmosphere was so good that a lot of straight couples used to try and go, and they used to stop them. They used to say, you know, you'd go in with someone, say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not letting you in because I think you're straight. Uh, it was apartheid uh, turned around. Those lucky enough to get past the bouncers entered the inner sanctum, gay sex at its raunchiest. I always found it very intimidating. Um, I was actually persuaded to go there once for an underwear evening where you had to take off your clothes at the door and just wear underwear. And I can't tell you what a dick I felt. I felt just awful because all these muscled people and, you know, and everyone on poppers. That intense kind of solidarity of being on a dance floor with hundreds, hundreds of other people stripped to the waist, sweating, and just going for it. On the dance floor, gay sex had gone a la carte. Every taste imaginable was catered for. I believe that um, depending on whether you've got it in your right or your left pocket means whether you give or receive. I know that yellow stands for something to do with golden showers. I don't know what that means. The hanky code always confused me because was it left hand pocket give? And I always thought, you know something, 
I was never into like one thing. I was into like you know meeting someone and having sex, not just thinking right. I just want that, and I just want that, and then a bit of that, <laughs> and then perhaps later on a bit of that. You know, so I didn't really pay much attention to it. The extraordinary possibilities of Heaven's hedonism crossed over into the mainstream with the defining pop culture moment of the 80s. It was shocking, and it was irresistible. The message to the uptight, sexually conflicted straight world was simple. Thank you to Hollywood. Basically, were what you saw at Heaven. It was the leather. It was the Castro clone, le- very sexualized image of a gay man, in pop, suddenly put into a pop idiom, and for, for kids like me, that was incredibly、uh, exciting because they looked like they actually might have sex. For me, it was like this is what pop music is. It's the ultimate party. Here's a kind of party I've never gone to before, but sounds fantastic. Let's put a bit of that into a pop song. This is the sound of gay clubs, i.e., high energy. You know, produced by、um, Trevor Horn into this hua sound. It was really, really, really aggressively sexual. By the time a bewildered BBC decided to ban the song, it was too late. The message was out there. It was about sensuality, about hedonism, about having a good time, and pissing off as many people along the way as possible. I tried to figure out. Okay, well, how many members of the band are and aren't? And you used to try and find out. And you only discovered that the the lead singer and Paul were the, were gay, and the others apparently weren't. I did like the dynamic in the group between Paul and Holly and what were known as the lads, and the fact that lads, to an extent, represented the nation. That was weird, but also very interesting. That within the group itself was a kind of little metaphor for 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 the battles that were going on. More than Boy George or even Mark Allman, really, there was an exuberance and a, a savagery about the potential way, you know, the way that Paul and Holly brought into the mainstream something that, that previously had been in the shadows. Frankie Goes to Hollywood had three number ones on the trot. In the war for acceptance, gay men held the high ground of pop. <laughs> Yet at this very moment of triumph, disaster loomed. Throughout the early 80s, gay men continued to lead the straight world out of the dark ages of sexual repression. Prejudice was on the back foot. Personal freedom was the new political creed, and the economy was about to boom. Britain was swinging again for the first time since the 60s. And then, once again, the spectre of sexual fear raised its ugly head. In 1982, a barman at Heaven, Terence Higgins, collapsed at work. Two weeks later, he was dead. AIDS had reached Britain. By 1986, hundreds of gay men were dying of the disease. I first heard about AIDS in the school playground when I was about 13, 14, and、um, a friend of mine, Billy, said, "Have you heard the latest? If if gay." People have sex now; they die.、And、I said, "What do you mean?" And he said, "Oh, there's a special form of cancer that you get if you if you have sex with a bloke." And of course, it struck terror in my heart. All of a sudden, it just seems like all this hysteria had been whipped up, and this kind of like, and it gave all the people that had been homophobic、um, up till then ammo to to use against us even more, you know. It, it was it was kind of like blamed on us. I was doing a ward, a ward visit,、um, because they'd say it'd be really good if you could turn up and and just you know someone from East Enders is coming in, and they used to say that. And I walked into a ward, and there, sitting in that bed, was a close friend of mine who was HIV positive, who obviously felt so threatened that he couldn't even tell his close friends. I certainly. Romped around a lot, and、uh, uh, many of us had, and and nobody knew what 
form of romping was more likely to have created it than any other. And there were a lot of people, very close friends of mine, who were so terrified of it that they couldn't dare to get a test. Me being who I am, I couldn't bear not to know, so I got tested instantly. I remember being at one funeral and actually grieving and realising I was grieving for someone else and feeling so full of shame and guilt that I was not grieving for the person that was in the coffin because I, I was still grieving for the person who died a few years, be weeks before, who was so emotional, emotional and who was very close. The tabloids called it the gay plague. But despite the hysteria, gay attitude dictated the government's response. AIDS was not a gay problem, it was everybody's problem. There is now a deadly virus which anyone can catch from sex with an infected person. But you can't always tell if someone is infected. And unless we're all a lot more careful, the people who've died so far will be just the tip of the iceberg. I was very impressed with the government's response to um, public service announcements warning people about HIV and AIDS. It was really hard-hitting, heavy stuff, um, but it worked. We did have the fear of God put in us, though. <laughs> I did everybody who kind of grew up in the 80s. Um, which in some ways was a good thing, because I was very, very safe. When the nation needed to talk safe sex, the shame-free attitudes of the gay world showed the way. If your type doesn't have a bubble, if your type, you leave a couple of centimetres if it, so that the seminal fluid can collect and you roll it slowly down the penis. Now, right down. Um, I'd like to say, by the way, if I can do this on public television, I expect you to do this in private. It bred a great sense of solidarity and mutual support, a sense of community amongst gay people. And in the wider world outside, it appeared to breed sympathy and understanding rather than hatred and fear. Old prejudices were in decline. When I found out I was HIV was in Mallorca in, in the summer in 1998. And you, kind of, you sort of knew, I kind of knew because you, you had so many things being wrong with you, wrong with you and they were sort of all building up, you know. I was uh, diagnosed uh, back in um, late 87, early 88. Um, at, at the time, because there were no medical responses to it, uh, it, was a, it was a very frightening thing to happen. And uh, I, uh, uh, I sort of assumed at the time that um, yeah, this, was, uh, this, this was going to be fatal and quite quickly. There are many people now who can lead a useful, viable, perfectly normal kind of life um, uh, because the condition is now treatable. The fight against AIDS revitalized the politics of sex. Gay men regrouped and took on the establishment again, challenging the age of consent and demanding real acceptance. The 67 Act, of course, uh, put the age of consent at 21, whilst heterosexual sex uh, was legal at 16. And that discrimination remained on the statute book for uh, well over 30 years. I was 16, and Lee, uh, my first uh, real love affair, he was 24. And he said to me, we have to be really careful that very few people know, um, because you know, if you're below the age of 21, uh, I could end up in prison and you could probably end up in a, in a ball stool. Once you reached 21, when it was 21, you thought, you, it made you think of all those men that you'd slept with that could have been jailed for sleeping with you underage, you know. And then once you reach 21, you're in the same, you're in the same position. 16! Now! 16! Now! The campaign to equalise the age of consent only really took off in the mid-1990s. That's the first time we began to slowly get a significant number of MPs who were prepared to vote for equalisation at 16. There was a sort of, almost like a candlelit vigil -y feeling outside the House of Commons on the night. And when it was announced that the vote had gone through and that it, that it was 18, a spontaneous riot broke out. I remember the mood of the crowd really changing outside Westminster that day um, as the news of the vote sort of started filtering out, which um, turned into uh, just like rushing the doors. Everybody rushed the doors.
Uh, I got pushed over by a policeman, for, which I'm very proud of. It's the only time I've ever been pushed over by a policeman. I remember feeling very, very angry that, you know, we weren't seen as equals. You know, we were made to feel like it was wrong. We were second-class citizens. We were determined that our battle for equality would continue until we won. And indeed, it took a while yet, but eventually, about a decade later, we did get an equal age of consent. By the 1990s, even the economy was championing gay equality, as the power of the pink pound made it a linchpin of the consumer boom. Most gay men have a larger proportion of disposable income than, say, our straight counterparts. Um, I look at my, my straight friends who are married. They have wives to support sometimes. They always have children to support, schools to pay for. I think gay men have the fortunate position to be able to focus all their money on themselves. What the notion of the pink pound helped to do was to get people thinking that being lesbian and gay means just being a normal, accepted, perfectly ordinary member of society. You're a citizen, you spend money, you take services, you, you buy things in the shops, you do exactly the same sort of things that anyone else does. Any hip British city now boasted a gay village. They blended continental cafe culture with typically British brushness. It celebrates diversity, I think it, it, it creates a much more tolerant um, atmosphere. I think it creates a higher level of acceptability and integration in society. It's great to have an area where you feel in the majority, which is something that gay men never experience, or very, very rarely experience. It's important that we're gay in straight pubs and bars, and it's important that straight people are straight in gay pubs and, and bars. The, the, the ghetto is an important part of an emerging consciousness, but it's a temporary part. Gay men, it seemed, were having better sex, more often, with more people and with far less hassle than the rest of the nation. The very idea provoked moral outrage in some and envy in others. Instant gratification was gay sex's trump card. Nothing and nowhere was off limits, not even the public toilet. There were people who could barely function sexually unless they went through the, the, the thrill of, of, of the danger, the menace of uh, the public lavatory. I knew people who would drive back from, let's say, Newcastle to London and have a zigzag map in their minds of all the loos just off the Great North Road in which something wonderful might happen. For me, it was just like uh, a place for a quickie, really. You know, and if you can't be bothered going out all night and you don't want to go up the heath because it's scary up there, then just go in the loo. The police uh, ran what were called pretty policemen who would, in plain clothes, try and chat people up in pubs, in public lavatories, even outside pubs, and then arrest them when they succeeded in chatting them up. And there were thousands of arrests. They would have gone to some public lavatory or, t or park or whatever, and an attractive man would sort of come over and um, start flashing a bit of willy at them and they'd respond. Then they'd probably be arrested because the, the man flashing his willy was actually a plainclothes police officer. And in those days, um, most people didn't see that as being a problem. For decades, gay men and cops played cat and mouse for control of the urinal. The most high-profile casualty of this titanic struggle was George Michael in 1998. Millionaire star was booked under his real name, George S. Panayayutu, after he was seen committing the offence in a public toilet in a Beverly Hills park. Thirty years earlier and George's hand Shandy would have destroyed his career. Now he could use it to revitalise his image. I think George Michael handled the whole uh, aftermath of his cottaging arrest. Absolutely marvellously. I don't think he could have done things any better. He out-tabbed the tabs by the way that he handled the interviews afterwards and the song Outside, which was a fantastic enactment of his own kind of revenge on the Beverly Hills Police Department and the tabloids, and turning the idea of having sex outside into this, this aspirational kind of, it's fun, let's do it kind of song.
The outing of George Michael, the scandal that never was, was confirmation that gay sex now had chat show respectability, but only if gay men were prepared to play the game. Those that didn't could still put a cat amongst the pigeons. The 1990s saw Britain's sex life spice up like never before. The public seemed beyond shock, more worried about the house prices than anal sex. That is, until one gay comedian tested just how far you could go. The rebel was Julian Clary, and his target, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont. There was something very odd about the evening. It went on forever, and it was live, and there was something... You know, the idea of getting a bunch of comedians slightly kind of... Uh, subversive in their way anyway, altogether, and giving them live TV. It was obviously leading somewhere. To crown the king or queen of comedy, who better than the man never known to go for a single entendre when a good solid double would do? Please welcome Julian Clary. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Julian. Good to see you. How's it hanging? Oh, very well, thank you. In the room, it was, just, it was just part of the crazed state they were all in on whatever medication and stimulants and alcohol they were had and the, the liveness and Jonathan, sort of the weird ringmaster that he was, was playing that night. It's very nice of you to recreate hamster teeth for me here. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, I've just been fisting Norman Lamont. <laughs> Julian, talk about. Julian, talk about the red box. I thought that Julian Clary's "I've been fisting Norman Lamont" backstage mark, remark at the Comedy Awards was one of the single funniest moments in British television history. The word "fisting" seemed to bring forward. Um, everything that, that middle-of-the-road people fear, the Daily Mail, Middle Britain people fear about what it is that, that, that gay men get up to. Those that aren't the type that consider homosexuality a disease or something you can cure, those that are just interested in, in life and living and difference and sharing, they're immediately interested because they've heard, they've, they've had a signal about something and they want to know what it is and, the, you know, the establishment hates that leaking. He took a risk, he went through hard times, real hard times after that. And I just think anyone who can go out there and, you know, and really, really push it as far as he did, deserves our, our applause. Somehow, Britain recovered, and by the end of the 90s, it looked as if gay was safe again, as the camp queen made a triumphant return to British sitcom. Do you mind? What, cheat? Don't dare hit me. I used to get uh, guys coming up to me in the street going, God, you're so offensive, you know. I mean, I mean you, you, you treat us all as if we're all camp queens. And I'm like, so, sorry, love, but, you know, you know, there are stereotypes for a reason. The character did have a penis. You know, he did cop off and had sex. And those, you, Larry Grace and John Inman and um, Dick Emery and the, the characters they portrayed um, didn't. I'll, um be fingering through Richard III till he comes. <laughs> then after years of flirting, TV took the plunge and broadcast a show without a trace of sugar-coated camp. I can imagine that straight people watching that and probably would have felt jealous. Queer as Folk chronicled the lives of three gay lads in Manchester. It featured the most explicit sex scenes ever screened on network TV. I thought it was very brave. I thought it was very groundbreaking. Um, I think the first episodes were a shock to a lot of people, but I think it continued as a success because at the end of the day, they created interesting characters that you cared about. Now, sometimes you're halfway through a shack and you just get bored of him. So you wank him off in a doorway and move straight on. Because you keep on looking. That's why you keep going out. There's always some new bloke, some better bloke, just waiting around the corner. And that was the night he came along. The one night stand that never went away. It was like reality turned up. Um, so you could recognise all of the characters in them as people that you knew, even though 
they were more extreme than the people that we knew and the situations that they got into. So what do you like doing? I like watching telly. What do you like doing in bed? Uh, this is fine. Reming. It probably put the idea in a lot of people's minds that um, the male anus, or even just the anus, doesn't have to be a male anus, is an erogenous zone. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be rogered. Here were people having anal sex, having threesomes, sperm was flying everywhere, they were sweaty, it was quite animalistic, and it was fabulous. And um, as a writer, I remember thinking, God, he's really, really raised the bar now. What, where do you go from here? told you about that, did they? And I remember just being completely blown away by it. And I do remember thinking, gay characters on television will never be the same again. As the credits rolled, it seemed there were no more secrets for gay sex to share. The Ravens didn't abandon the tower, the Queen didn't abdicate, and Brian Dowling won Big Brother. The nation had survived. In 2005, gay couples got the right to marry. Nearly 40 years after the legalization of gay sex, gay love won the ultimate badge of mainstream respectability. I cannot explain, really, how different it makes you feel. It's about peace of mind and security. It was just a, a wonderful moment to, to know that uh, at long last, after being in a relationship for something like 18 and a half years, this uh, was a moment when we could make it real, make it official. Well, the ceremony is now over. Elton John and David Furnish were inside the Guildhall for just over three quarters of an hour. And now, just as they did before they went in, it's all smiles and poses for the waiting fans and the hordes of media. It was just unbelievable. I, I never thought I would live my life and see a day where I could publicly and legally um, you know, announce that I'm gay and, and this is the man that I love and have society be so accepting of it. It's just one of those lovely bits of legislation uh, that helps to free people up, that helps to bring equality and to end discrimination, but makes people happy at the same time. There are very few bits of law that you can say do that. Not everyone is thrilled. For many of us, the whole um, idea of a marriage, which is essentially what a civil partnership is, is just something we don't want to have to think about. And the problem is, once this exists, it's like I, my theory that most heterosexuals get married because marriage exists. You know, a point comes when you say, why don't you want to marry me? Of course everybody wants the legal protection. But I'm not really sure that personally I want that kind of approval. Um, I'm not sure I want to be civilized. Cyberspace, the new frontier offered gay men the chance to get back to their roots. And in the digital playground, there were fewer rules than ever before. Gay has become a phenomenon. I mean, I mean, I remember going to a party like four or five years ago and everyone just discussing their gaydar profile. And you could not take part in the conversation at this party if you didn't have a gaydar profile. It was the only topic of discussion. If you want to use this as a hardcore, heavy, cruising, meet for sex now kind of device, then Yes, you can use it for that. If you're 16 and a bit nervous about going out, it's a great way of just starting to chat to people. I sort of miss the Gaydar boat, um, in a sense, because I've been without them for 13 years. But I have a lot of friends that use Gaydar. Um, and, and when they explain it to me, they just said they, they got a little bit fed up with going through the routine of going to clubs and standing around with loud music and people blowing smoke in their face. A friend of mine actually used Gaydar a lot, but in a kind of romantic way and, and, and in a really, like, he was looking for a boyfriend and I thought, you'll never find a boyfriend on Gaydar. People say that, you'll never find a boyfriend on Gaydar. But he did and they're still together, it's like nearly been a year. There's no pursuit, there's just typing. There's just more office work. You know, this is a male homosexual at work. This is a male homosexual 
after work you can enter your postcode and it will tell you who's online in like half a mile's radius of you. Um, so for someone like me who could be quite lazy, that would be a good thing, I think. <laughs> I'll find someone online, arrange to meet them, go around, have a quick shag, leave, then maybe may, may, maybe in some cases go, go back online again and find someone else for later, you know what I mean? So it's become this kind of fast food equivalent of sex. Where gaydar has led the way, the straight world is running fast just to keep up. Similar sites for playful heterosexuals are now all over the internet. Hard now to imagine a time when gay men, let alone gay sex, had no place in public life. In the early 70s, one of the prime tenets of gay liberation was that gay liberation is everyone's liberation. Being around gay people has, has given a lot of straight people a chance to relax a lot. There's a relationship to your body and a relationship to sex and so on, which uh, gay people have obviously you know, have pioneered, which, uh, which has done straight people a lot of good. In just 40 years, gay sex has moved out of the shadows and into the spotlight, outing the sexual freedoms of a whole nation along the way. I never came out. I still haven't. Um, but I think I have slowly emerged. I feel, as, I feel as a gay man living in Britain, I can live my life um, absolutely 100% in the way that I want to. Um, and it always feels like it's getting better, not worse. It's been a roller coaster ride from fear to fun and all the emotions in between. And like it or not, there's no way back. I have to remember um, not how lucky we are because it shouldn't be down to luck and we shouldn't feel blessed that we've been allowed to be equal. Um, but just. Just what a different world it is It is for a teenager growing up gay now to the teenager I was when I was growing up gay. I'm really comfortable with who I am now, and I don't care who knows. And it doesn't affect, you know, um, your profession or who you are as a person. You know, if anything, these days, you know, it's thumbs up. If you've been affected by any of the issues in this programme or want to join a debate online, there's more information available at channel4.com slash gay season. So how does it feel to be gay in modern Britain? And do we still have a way to go? A live studio debate in 40 years out, tomorrow at 11 on 4. Next, PartyPoker.com, Premier League Poker.